In our criminal justice system, crime is understood as a violation against the state, a violation of the law. And I feel like there's something missing there. There's something not intuitive about considering crimes to just be breaking a rule and that the only victim would be the state. Restorative justice looks at crime as a violation of people and of relationships. It understands individuals as interconnected in a community. We may not always feel like we are part of a community, but many victims of crime have that feeling. They look to a community that may not be there. Most restorative processes bring together victims of crime with the offender and community stakeholders for a facilitated conversation about what happened and to problem solve. Victims are given the opportunity to speak about what the experience of the incident was like for them, and offenders hear that. Offenders also have the opportunity to explain what was going on in their life and what led to their decisions and their actions. Victims can ask offenders questions about why they did what they did and how can they make things right. And the community together comes to a solution of how to move forward and how to meet the needs of the victim. It's an inclusive process. By giving victims a voice and a seat at the table, it can be very empowering. It also holds offenders accountable to the victim that they've harmed and to the community. And by including community stakeholders in a conversation where you hear from the victim and from the offender, it can provide an opportunity to discuss underlying causes of crime in our communities, the real reason why some of these crimes are continuing to happen. Before coming to law school, I, I worked with victims of domestic violence and in case after case, I watched as our criminal justice system completely failed to meet their needs. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about one of the women that I worked with. Sarah was a college student, and she was sexually assaulted by her ex-boyfriend. She came to me to create a safety plan and to discuss her options. Sarah was afraid of pressing charges because she thought that he or his friends might retaliate against her. But she also wasn't okay with just not doing anything about it. She was angry and she felt violated and she wanted him to know that what he did was wrong. She wanted him to understand why it was wrong. She had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder after the incident and was having panic attacks, trouble focusing, and she decided that she should take some time off school so she was moving home. Before she moved home, she did go forward with charges. Her ex-boyfriend was charged with sexual assault. He pleaded no contest, which means he didn't have to admit guilt, uh, but he did accept punishment. His sentence was three years of probation, and Sarah watched the proceedings from the back of the courtroom. And she met with me afterwards, and she was so upset. She was upset that the judge didn't say anything about the sexual assault. She said the process moved so quickly, it was just the lawyers talking and then the judge issued his findings and she said he never explained why it was wrong. And I wasn't surprised. The judges rarely talk to the offender about what they've done. That's not really part of it. Sarah didn't have the option of a restorative justice proceeding but now when I do restorative justice, I think about her a lot and a lot of the other victims that I worked with. I remember Sarah saying to me that what she really wanted was for him to understand that her whole life had been turned upside down. And she felt that he never got that and that nothing would stop him from just doing this again. Because it, no matter what the sentence was, she felt that until someone looked him in the eye and said, this is what you did to my life, that he wouldn't see that it was wrong. There are a lot of different models of restorative justice. In Sarah's case, uh, 
I think, I think when we look at crimes of sexual violence or violent crimes in general, there is a reason why we punish those crimes sometimes with imprisonment. You know, there, restorative justice doesn't suggest that we completely dismantle the criminal justice system. It suggests that there's something missing. So some restorative justice processes would be able to occur even after the sentencing. So Sarah would have been able to, if this was offered, meet with the, her ex-boyfriend, with a facilitator, and discuss the harms done to her, and to come up with solutions for those harms separate from the criminal justice system. But there are other models that would be diversionary programs. So there are plenty of cases where a victim doesn't come forward at all because they don't want to be involved with the criminal justice system. They don't want charges to be pressed, but they do want an outcome or an agreement. So those, there are a lot of options. So when you picture restorative justice, they don't want you to get an idea that it's only one way. It's principles that we can incorporate in many different parts of the process. It seems to me, from working with victims, that just having more options could make a huge difference. So many victims that came in to do safety planning, like Sarah, didn't want to press charges at all. And if they had a restorative process as an option, we may be able to engage with them um, and offer services, like the kind that are <laughs> offered but rarely utilized, crisis counseling, safety planning, a feeling of support from the community. So I don't suggest that the criminal justice system forgot about victims. I think what's happening is there's an assumption being made that the goals of the criminal justice system will in, somehow, in some way satisfy what the community needs and what victims want. The goals of deterrence and retribution, I think, are assumed to meet victim and community needs. So I would just suggest that we think about that a little bit more because maybe they partially do, but there's clearly something missing. If we wish to build a safer society and meet the needs of the community, we might want to engage more in discussions with actual community members and victims of crime. Thinking about retribution, I think of people saying that a criminal is in prison paying his debts or her debts to society. And I wonder, what are those debts and who's getting that payment? Um, Edna and Sheldon um, were an 80-year-old, or in their 80s, a couple, that came home on a Sunday afternoon to find their door busted open and their belongings scattered throughout their house. And it took them a long time to put everything back in place. And they called the police. They were scared. The police found two teenage boys that had been responsible for breaking into their home and stealing some jewelry and a laptop. And Edna and Sheldon did not want to press charges through the criminal justice system. They had a lot of doubts about what youth offenders experience and how the criminal justice system might make their life take a turn for the worse. Um, luckily, the restorative justice program that I'm involved with took their case. And in the circle, Edna was able to ask the teenage boys, why did you choose our house? Like, why, why us? And where in the house did you go? That was very important to her. She wanted to know if they had gone through her drawers, if they had looked through her things. She just felt violated and she wanted answers. And the teenagers were able to express <coughs> feelings of shame. They were able to apologize and Edna and Sheldon were still angry. The agreement that they came to involved paying back um, and returning stolen items, but also the boys would do community service. I don't think that Edna and Sheldon felt an overwhelming feeling of forgiveness or anything like that, so I would push back on some, some people say that's an element to restorative justice. It's something more, uh, it's just deeper than that. I think it's just a recognition of humanity. They were able to hear why the teenagers had made those choices and what their lives were like. And I think that everyone in the circle learned a little bit more about how difficult it can be for youths and why they might turn to doing something like this. In that way, restorative justice inspires me that in any realm, that we find ourselves in, whether it's the criminal justice system or another area of law or any
conflict we're having with another person. I think it's really important to remember that even though we don't always feel like we're part of a community, that we are interconnected. And I've seen the transformative effects of that dialogue on an offender. One of our facilitators was a career bank robber in and out of prison, and he said he never felt remorse for his acts, but he never thought that there were victims. He was robbing banks. And now he looks back and he works with young offenders. He's reminded that, of course, there are victims of crimes. Of course, there were people there when he robbed the bank who were traumatized by the experience. He said if he had to look across the table from someone who had been hurt by what he had done, it would change the way he thought about his actions. I think it's really important for us to remember that we are motivated by the relationships that we have with other people. And recognizing that and trying to understand what's underlying conflict and crime can build a safer community and can empower people who've been harmed. Thank you so much.